Today we are discussing something called Hooke's Law, named after the guy who came up with this little relationship. And of course, Hooke's Law describes the restoring force of a spring or it doesn't have to be an actual spring it's basically anything that is springy lots of things act springy so it doesn't have to be an actual spring uh, basically anything that's under tension being stretched or compression being squished is going to be somewhat springy some things more than others Strong force of the spring, when an applied force stretches or compresses. So that's kind of the wordy verbal definition of it. And then what we'll do is draw some pictures to get an idea of what that would look like. So, I'll let you copy that down, then I'll start underneath. Let's imagine we have a spring. Well, if we take the uh, take a force and we pull on the end of that spring, we will stretch it. So now I'll draw the spring sort of stretched out to here. And the reason it's been stretched is because we have applied a force to it. F applied. Now, at this point, we're holding on to this spring. It's in its stretched state. There is a force, obviously, according to Newton's laws, that is pulling backwards against me, and that would be called the restoring force of the spring. We'll call it Fs. And the interesting thing about it is because we are not, not accelerating in any way, the restoring force of the spring is equal to, uh, equal to the force applied in magnitude only. Obviously, they're not equal because they're in different directions. But remember, this is our symbol for magnitude only. It's the absolute value signs. So that basically means it's the same amount of force pulling in both directions. But the direction depends on whether you want to talk about the force being applied to the spring or the force of the spring holding back or trying to restore itself. So normally, we think of Hooke's Law in terms of the force in the spring. But you can also think of it in terms of the force that's applied, as we'll see. The same thing would happen if you, uh, oh, one more thing, sorry. The distance that we stretch the spring is also important. So we call this little distance x. x is how far the spring is being stretched. And uh, if we were to draw another spring that was sort of like this normally, if this is the normal spring without any forces on it, and we were to compress this spring, squish it up, we're going to do that by applying a force this way. We would squeeze into the spring, F applied. And of course, uh, the distance that we have compressed or squashed the spring is also X. Right? And then the spring would be pushing back. I'll just squeeze it up here on top with the, the force, the restoring force of the spring. And again, the two forces would be equal in magnitude, but in opposite directions. Technically, you'll notice also that the x's are in different directions. If they are displacements, which they are, this little x is a displacement to the right. This little x is a displacement to the left. So the directions get all fuzzy here. But it's easier to visualize the springs without worrying about plus and minus, left and right, and just look at how they're set up and in the context. The important thing that you should notice is that 
the F applied is always opposite. It's always in the opposite direction to the force of the spring. Those two are always reversed, fighting against each other. Right? So, how do we describe this mathematically? Well, the other thing that matters, uh, of course, how far you stretch it, but also how springy the spring is. Some springs are very springy and easily stretched, easily compressed, like a sinking spring, right? Others are very, very tight and hard to stretch or compress. So we have um, a number called a spring constant. And the spring constant is usually called a small k. And what it is, is it tells us basically how much force you need to stretch or compress a spring. And it's measured in newtons per meter. How many newtons of force are required to stretch a particular spring a meter? That's what it means. And typically, you'll see k values maybe 5 or 10 newtons for tiny little springs that don't take much force, but into the thousands or tens of thousands of newtons per square per meter uh, for larger, heavier springs. So we have the x, which is how far the spring is being stretched, and the k, which is how springy the spring is, and then, of course, the force. And we're going to put all these together. And here is Hooke's law. The restoring force of the spring is equal to negative kx. This is how it's often written in textbooks. The negative sign is important because it's telling us that the restoring force of the spring will always be in the opposite direction to the direction that it's being stretched or compressed <laughs> in, right? So if you go back to our pictures, when we pushed inward to the spring, the x was to the left or negative, and the restoring force is to the right, opposite direction. When we stretch the spring up here, we had a force that was pulling to the right, causing a displacement or a stretch to the right, which is a positive x, and then the restoring force of the spring is to the left. So that's what the negative sign is for, but it does tend to create a lot of trouble. Another way to think of Hooke's Law, and the way that I like to do it, is to write the expression this way, f equals kx. And what this does is it tells you the magnitude only. It doesn't really worry about which way it's going to go, because you can tell from the context quite simply which way the force would go. Right? We know that if you squeeze a spring, it's going to push back. If you pull it, it's going to pull back. So if you use it this way, it tells you the magnitude only. And that means because it's the magnitude only, the F can stand for the F applied, or it can stand for the restoring force of the spring, which are really the same amount, the same magnitude, but in opposite directions. And when you're solving problems, this seems to work a lot easier and simpler. Okay. So I'll give you an example and show you how both would work. But then I'm probably going to gravitate towards this one, which is a little bit easier to get your head around and less confusing. So let's do a simple example. Okay. Um, how much force is required to stretch a spring, and we'll say that this spring has a k value of 200 newtons per meter, and we want to stretch it um, by 0 0.6 meters. So how much force would it take to do that? Well, there are two ways to do it. If we use the traditional Hooke's law with the negative sign, we would start with this, right? And this is why this is a little bit tricky, because to plug in the numbers, 
Well, the restoring force of the spring would be equal in magnitude to the force that is stretching the spring. This, this in the question, we're asking for the applied force. So what you would write here is uh, Fs, the restoring force of the spring, is negative, and then the K is 200, and the X is 0 0.6. And we're going to assume, we're going to have a picture in our head that we're stretching the spring this way. So the amount that it's been stretched is a positive X, and the force being applied to it would be in a positive direction which means the restoring force of the spring is going to be to the left, which is why we have this negative sign right here for the restoring force of the spring, to show that it's in the opposite direction. And then we would multiply all that, and you would get uh, 120, right? Newtons. Oh, no, sorry. No, that's right. 120 as the restoring force of the spring, negative. But the question didn't ask what the restoring force of the spring was. It asked for how much force is required to stretch it. So what really matters here is not the direction, but just the 120 newtons. Really, 120 newtons is the answer to the question. That's what the applied force would be. So you see why that negative is all messed up. So instead, if we just go, all right, let's just think about how much. Don't think about directions. Then the force, now we can still call it Fs, but we'll just think of it as spring force or applied force. It could be the force applied to a spring or it could be the force restoring the spring. It doesn't matter. Equals kx. So then we just solve the question 200 times 0 0.6 which gives us an amount 120 newtons. But we have to remember that this is only the magnitude of the force. So we say to ourselves, okay, that's how much it would be. That's the force that would be required to stretch this spring. So that's the answer to our question. If we wanted to know which direction it was in, then we would have to relate it to the picture we've drawn. But the picture we've drawn says the force would be positive, right? But what if I drew it the other way? If I drew it all backwards, it would all be the same, except the force would look negative. So really, the magnitude only is usually what we're after when we talk about the spring force. And that's a lot simpler, just to figure out how much it is. And then you can look at the arrows in your picture to determine which way it should go. Let's do another example. Um, a billiard ball. Pool ball. Uh, strikes the side of the bumper and compresses it. Compresses the bumper on the edge of the pool table. So that bumper is acting like a spring. It's being squashed a little bit, and then it will pop back out, and it will push the ball away. So it doesn't have to be a spring, right? It could be anything that's springy. It compresses the bumper on the edge of a pool table. Let's say that the K value for that bumper is uh, 2,000 newtons per meter. Which means if you wanted to squish that bumper a whole meter's worth, you'd need a whole lot of force. So it's pretty springy, very springy bumper. Uh, you don't have to push it very hard to get a lot of force out of it. And let's say that um, the, the ball strikes the bumper with a force of It's just a ball on a pool table, so it wouldn't be very big. Oh, let's say 20 newtons. Does that work? No, let's use a different number so we don't confuse it with the 2,000. Let's use uh, 15 newtons. The question we might want to know is how far will, or how much, will the bumper compress? How much of a dent are we going to make in that bumper when the ball strikes it? Okay. All right. If we were to try and do it with the negative sign, we would have to draw a picture and figure all out which was left and which was right. 
But if we do it the other way, if we just say that the relationship is F equals KX for springy things, right? Then we can simply substitute the uh, 15 newtons of force right here for the force that's being applied to the spring. That will also end up being the restoring force that the spring pushes back on the ball. It's kind of like Newton's, uh, Newton's laws in action, right? Equal and opposite reaction force. The K, we said, was 2,000 newtons per meter. And so they want us to find the X, how far it will compress. So that's just division. And so 15 divided by 2,000 is 0 0.003. Seven point five. Oh, I see. It's back and backwards. So decimal what? Give me the decimals. Decimal zero zero seven five. Right. We're dividing by. We did fifteen divided by two thousand, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. That would be meters. So that's about seven and a half millimeters. Just a little wee bit, which is what you'd expect on a pool table, right? You wouldn't expect a bumper to go on this big amount. It would just be, okay? And that would be the X. Now, the question would be, well, which way? Well, obviously, the context tells us that it will compress whichever way the ball is coming, right? The force of the ball and the compression would be lined up. So if you did it this way, then the X would be compressing this way. Both positive, applied force and positive, and the restoring force would be negative. But of course, you could also draw the picture the other way and have an X that's compressing this way, if you did it this way. So you see how the direction can become just a big confusing problem. And with springs, it's far easier just to do magnitude only. So we know that this is how far or how much it would compress, but we don't know which way unless we look at the actual picture or the actual description. Okay. Let's do an example where springs get a little bit tougher. Let's imagine that we have uh, uh, the ceiling here, and we've attached a spring to the ceiling, and then we've hung on it a big weight, eight kilograms. Now let's say that the K for this little spring is uh, 200 newtons per meter. Well, obviously, if we didn't have the weight on it, the spring wouldn't be quite so stretched. It might be just like that. So obviously, there's going to be a certain amount of stretch in the spring, right? Because of the weight that's holding on to it, pulling it downwards. So we put the weight on there, and we wait a minute so it stops bouncing up and down. So it's just sitting there quietly and happy, not moving with the stretched spring. And the question we want to know is, how far will this spring stretch with that X? How far will this spring stretch? Well, now we have something a little more complicated than just F equals KX. We have to use this within our F net equations and free body diagrams like we learned before. So let's draw a free body diagram of the 8 kilogram mass. Obviously, there's a force pulling down on it, right? Which is our good friend, gravity. What force is holding it up? The force that is in the spring. So it's the spring force. The force that's in the spring holding it up. There's no normal force. There's no surface or anything. It's just hanging there. So we could write an F net equation that said F net, and I guess we would call it Y since we're talking up and down, right, equals two things, a spring force and a gravity force working together. And we would write MA because of Newton's second law, like we always do, but now we know that the magnitude of this is going to be KX, right? Spring force is KX, and then we have MG. And for now, they're all positive, but once we put our numbers in, we will tell the math which way these arrows go. So M is 8 
we don't expect any acceleration because the conditions of the question are that it's just hanging there, not moving. And then we have kx. So we put our k, which was given to us over here, as 200 newtons per meter. And of course, we're looking for the x. But now that I'm putting in the numbers, I want to go back to my picture and decide whether I should call this a positive or a negative number. And looking at the red arrow, it's up. The springs, this amount of force that I'm calling it is pulling up. So I will call it positive 200x. And then, of course, negative for the downward gravity, 8 times 9.8. .8, we already know that. And so you can see how all we have to do now is solve this 0 equals 200x minus uh, 78.4, right? And so you move it to the other side, and that equals 200x, and you divide, and the amount would be, what is that? 78.392, so about almost 40 centimeters, meters. Now, you could argue, well, is that up or down? Well, we can look at the picture to determine that. We don't need the math to tell us the direction because obviously that the spring is being stretched by gravity this way. So in a sense, gravity is like the applied force on the spring. And the x is in the same direction as the gravity. And the restoring force is the upward force. And that's how we can use springs inside ethnet equations. So now you have just one more little thing that can be thrown into the mix as a force to add in your equations. And then uh, further to this, there is the worksheet from before, which I'll show you in a minute, that has questions to practice springs.